And what's up, everybody, and welcome to Lights, Camera, Exploitation, your guide to exploitive cinema. This is your host with the motherfucking most, TJ Bowser, and joining me, as always, is my doppelganger, Kangabanger from Down Under, Mr. Brody Kane. How y'all doing? And Slick Nick, the king of the rendezvous. Ciao, amici. So today is March 5th, 2021, and we got a banger of an episode for you today. But first, it's time for your slice of life. Nick, how was your week? My week's not been bad. Uh, it's been a little bit slow, which honestly is just mostly been relaxing more than anything else. Um, I'm not really doing much of anything until this weekend. I'm going to the museum tomorrow with a few friends, but that's be about it. Uh, I don't really have a lot going on until uh, I got a wedding next week. That's about it. <laughs> uh, so you're going to announce now that you will be absent from next week's episode. Yes, uh, I unfortunately will not be here for the next week's episode. So I'm going to miss Matt. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. A little bummed. I'm still probably going to watch it. <laughs> probably like this weekend anyway uh, actually so. I think next episode is Razorback that would be correct there, oh Kansas. that's it yeah Brody how's your week um yeah the same as always um I don't really do much other than watch films um uh, other other than that work has been pretty slow um same old same old with me mate it's um yeah it's it's very very boring it's like Groundhog Day down here so yeah but I'm really really excited to dive into this uh highly underappreciated gen so yeah absolutely it's gonna be a doozy well uh i got a new camera in today i got a sony sv1 here on the video feed i'll show you guys it's pretty yeah i got this <laughs> it does that camera thing where you can pull out the screen you can look at yourself so uh it's good for the content creation you guys saw a little uh sample video today so there'll be some awesome mm-hmm. upgrades to come here on project louder i'm excited to show all of you guys that Got some new films coming. Got Mad Max, like uh, Nick said. We will be doing that this season. So I got the 4K. So I am prepared when that is time. Uh, I do have Razorback already on Blu-ray. I got that imported from Australia. So that's going to be awesome whenever we're ready to review that film as well. Uh, but yeah, got some new Blu-ray cabinets in. Expanded my capacity for uh, for films. So uh, let's see where that takes me. <laughs> but yeah, get that filled up. Yeah, it comes with dividers, so I have everything divided by uh, company now. So it's uh, it's pretty cool. But anyway, let's talk about this week's film, which is 1965's The Possessed. In Italy, it's known as La Donna del Lago, or the American TV version Love, Hate, and Dishonor. Directed by Luigi Bozzoni, who did the Spaghetti Western Man Pride and Vengeance in 1968, The Fifth Chord in 1971, which is a Jallo film, which is... And Brothers Blue in 1973, and he worked alongside Klaus Kinski on Footprints on the Moon in 1975. Hey, I'm not doing this! Fuck him! Pick another one, that's shit! The man himself. And we have yes. a second director here, Franco Rosalini, who did Tarimia in 1968, Brothers Blue in 1973, and Caligula in 1979. So did they... Co-direct on Brothers Blue? Looks like it. Again, excellent. It looks like from uh, well, yeah. from research, research that uh, Franco Rosalini is more of like a backseat director because his later roles would be mostly produ- producing and stuff. So I think that that's kind of where he feels the most comfortable. Written by Luigi Bazzone, Bazzoni, Franco Rosalini, Giulio Questi, and Ernesto Gaspaldi. Ernesto Gaspaldi is like the king of Jallo writing. Uh, some examples of his other work would be The Murder Clinic from 1966. I read the description of that film, the Brody, and about Coom in his pants. Uh, so sweet, so converse. <laughs> in 1969, All the Colors of the Dark ugh, from 1972, and The Suspicious Death of a Minor in 1975. Those films are just the top of the iceberg of his deep, 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 deep cinematography. And he is just the best. Uh, He has wrote all the Golden Age stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. Cinematographer, you guys will like this, Leonida Barboni, a female. She is known for The Seducer, Man of Straw in 1958, The Lovemakers in 1961, La Corazon in 1963, and The Sex of Angels in 1968. Music by Renzo Rossellini, which is the father of Franco, the director. He's known for Rome, Open City in 1945. Paisan! In 1946, <laughs> 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 Legions of the Nile in 1959, and Caligula in 1979. A budget on this film of 126 million 662 thousand 766 lira. That's Italian lira. 
<laughs> Starring Peter Baldwin as Bernard. He also starred in I Married a Monster from Outer Space in 1958, The Ghost in 1963, The Weekend Murders in 1970, Verna Lisi as Tilda, How to Murder Your Wife in 1965, Not My Wife You Don't, 1966, and Beyond Good and Evil in 1977. And of course, Felipe Leroy as Mario. He's known for his work on Latrow in 1960, Treasure Island in Outer Space in 1987. That sounds like a good time. And <laughs> 1990s, Nakita! I just wanted to say that like uh, the wrestler Nakita. Uh, <laughs> I can't blame you. Ina Balboa as Quarter, A Queen for Caesar in 1967, Day of Anger in 1967. Sorry. Queen of An- Caesar, 1962. Day of Anchor, 1967. And Street People, 1976. And one of the most interesting of the cast here is Pia Lindstrom yeah. as Adriana, who is the lesser known first child of actress Ingrid Bergman. Uh, Casablanca, enough said? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Casablanca, man. <laughs> yeah. She has other small roles in the marriage Italian style in 1964 and The Queens in 1966, which I believe is a television show. And she played a character that's pretty much herself in 1996 in Rusha Famin. Best way you can say Hard it. I can tell they're, uh, they're Swedish. <laughs> 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 Valentina Corsese as Irma. Uh, she play worked in The Evil Eyes in 1963 for Mario Bava. So, Jello. Bava uh, Jello. Oh, Grandmother's Dead in 1963. And once again, with a Golden Age Jello film, The Iguana, with The Tongue of Fire from 1971. Salvo Radone as Mr. Enrico. He played in The Tenth Victim in 1965. Machine Gun McCain in 1969. And the Jello film, My Dear Killer, which has a sweet saw scene from 1972. So who wants to read the plot of this bad boy? I can do that if you like, Mr. Bowser. Sarah named me with that sweet Aussie accent, baby. <clears throat> right, just getting <laughs> in the zone. <laughs> a young writer, Bernard, returns to the small town where he had a vacation previously. He goes to visit Tildy, a young woman with whom he had a brief sexual relationship with. However, she isn't there and the locals are not keen on talking about why. Bernard learns that she has been killed and her body was thrown into the lake. The writer presses on his investigations and as he goes through the town, casual encounters build up an atmosphere of menace. Fucking A. So, stuff. yes, this film won no awards. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually really disappointing. Or none that yeah. we uh, actually found. So let's talk about this. So I said that the film's initial budget expenditure, as we like to say, uh, was 126 million lira, give or take. But only made about 100 million back. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, yeah, learning about the uh, release for it, it doesn't surprise me. It seems yeah. like it didn't start off. <laughs> doing is, too particularly great is especially because they, I mean, they even had to rename it for the possessed uh in i think it was the uk was the first country that i saw that they did that in this is like a cult jallo the, film yeah right? a cult <laughs> jallo drama psychological drama it's 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 a mixture of multiple things and we'll get deeper into that as this episode progresses <laughs> yeah fucking a so i'd say brody you want to get physical <laughs> let's get physical <laughs> So I got the Arrow video release, which was released in April 2nd, 2019, and it features a brand new 2K restoration from the original camera negative, a high-definition Blu-ray, 1080p presentation, original Italian and English soundtracks, titles, and credits, uncompressed mono PCM audio, and that is the only way to watch this motherfucking movie. Newly translated English subtitles for the Italian soundtrack, optional English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, or the English soundtrack. New audio commentary by writer and critic Tim Lucas, and it is exquisite. Richard Dreyer on the possessed and newly filmed video appreciation by the cultural critic and academic. Cat's Eyes, an interview with the film's makeup artist Giannetto Di Rossi. Two days a week, an interview with the film's award-winning Assistant art director Dante Ferretti, The Legacy of the Bazzoni Brothers, an interview with actor-director Francesco Borelli, a close friend of Luigi and Camilio Bazzoni, 
Original trailers, reversible sleeve featuring original and newly commissioned artwork by Sean Phillips. So, Brody, you actually bought this. That I did, but it never came. It never came. It hasn't come yet. It hasn't come yet. Well, yes, technically. And it, as it would be my luck, as always, yes. uh, it'll show up Monday after the fucking show. And, <laughs> yes, uh, it's just like, obviously, I'm really excited to have it. Mm-hmm. But, it, yeah, it, I'm really looking forward to actually getting it. And it is the Arrow release, too. So, um, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to see the behind the scenes. Um, special features and all that stuff that that Arrow have chucked on this bad boy. I do like the uh, original artwork, but I think the Arrow's uh, artwork is just exquisite. It is like the smoke. It's like uh, the girl's Tilda. She's in the background, but she's kind of almost like smoke coming from the guy's cigarette. Yeah. Yeah, from Bernard's cigarette. It's really cool. It's beautiful artwork, and it features those mountains where the murders took place. Uh, it's actually the same mountains we saw d- doing some research about mm-hmm. this film. It's the, uh, it's yep. the Dolomites. Yep. Northern Italy. It's northeast. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So, yeah, this uh, this copy is absolutely exquisite. I've watched it multiple times, English, Italian, and the commentary now, and it's just a fever dream of fun. I absolutely enjoy every bit of this. But enough of that. Additional information, Brody. Actually, yeah, um, I got a little bit to, uh, to add here right off the bat that I added before you get into it. Uh, cool. Yep. So the flashback scenes have the contrast and the colors turned up. Most notable, the grave scene, and it's a visual way to show things aren't always how we remember them. Yes, I do like that, actually. That was the vibe I was getting um, upon viewing that scene. But that fucking scene in itself is incredibly well lit, shot. Mm-hmm. Everything about that just... Mm-hmm. Makes me jizz in my pants. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that that was yeah. That was sort of what I brought from it. It's like a bit of a, as as you were saying, bit of a fever dream type esque mm-hmm. thing. Like, is it real? Is it not real? I liked how they threw them in there just to play with you psychologically. Um, yeah, I think it also helps just- to prove Bernard is kind of an unreliable narrator of the whole thing as well. Oh, absolutely! Just yeah, you know, just because he's he's so out of it during the <laughs> the whole movie, uh, and he's just going back on things that he's remembered from you know past vacations, and we, I don't think it really establishes how long it had been uh, since he'd been there last. Yeah. Maybe I think before Brody touches on some of the more social aspects of this film, uh, I think before he sets the context in which this film was made, I think let's talk about like literally this film is driven by this man's own sexual perversion and obsession of this woman that he met once goes to this town just to find out that she was murked. And now he's like caught up in like this murder thing going on at this hotel. And he's like, what the fuck? And he's trying to figure out who murdered this girl. But like, why the fuck does it matter to you, bro? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's kind of established because he knows the family pretty close and personally, considering the amount uh, that they go out of their way to accommodate him when he gets there. Okay. Um, and the fact that I mean, he's oh, you mean the zombie people alone as well. Yes, oh. the, the spooky family <laughs> that the whole and I love thing how people yeah. in the who do reviews of this film, they're like, "Oh, the possessed is such a bad title. It should be Lady of the Lake." And it's like, no, because every other character seems like they're possessed by some unnatural force. That's the point of the fucking movie, you weirdos. Yeah, <laughs> everyone is just just so off. Enough yeah, exactly, it's almost like they're possessed. Every single person is a suspect and not. Being affected by it, not a victim, and not, you're like that, and it's just hard to tell uh, between all of them, mm-hmm. and especially like all the you know the dream sequences and everything, and all the cinematography just keep you so far on edge throughout the entire thing. Yeah, the whole thing is possessed. <laughs> yep, Brody, take it away. Um, the 1960s were basically a period of great productivity for the Italian film industries in 1964, where 290 films were produced in the country and 155 of these films were co-productions. So in 1965, there were 10,000 or over 10,000 cinemas in Italy and over 6,000 of which were industrial that screen films commercially and on a regular basis. So what the early 1960s basically represented like the documentaries, the gothic horror, but before we, before Westerns and spy movies um, even dominated the Italian 
exploitation cinema of the mid 60s a, a sexy art house thriller blow up from 1966 um which led many filmmakers to jump on the bandwagon so this basically showcased the rise of giallo or of the giallo the beginning genre. the beginning yeah pretty much mm-hmm. i'd um, say we don't see the really the the hardcore rise until 1971 Yes. That's whenever yeah, yeah. That's when- Argento will traverse barriers, crush hurdles, and mm. release the bird with the crystal plumage, <laughs> and it will just destroy uh, international barriers. So I can't wait to talk about it. I'm just so excited. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to show Brody. Nick, have you seen it before? No, I have not. Okay, I'm excited to show you too then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. On the 5th of February in 60, 1964, uh, Manolo Bellanini. Did I say that right, Mr. Bowser? Yep. Uh, the producer uh, acquired the rights of um, the Giovanni Commissi, Commissos? Yep, Commissos. Commissos. No, yeah. Commissos uh, novel, The Lady in the Lake from 1962 for 3 million lira. The filmmakers decided to hire a writer to adapt the text from the screen, to which is how Giello Questi, the screenwriter, became involved in the project. But despite Questi delivering excellent work in the past, personally Questi was not too convinced that the film had not been his own, stating that I wanted a certain kind of cinema, the one I was dreaming of. Hence, every time I was commissioned to work on something else that helped me to survive economically, I was upset because I was distracted from other projects and that's how I became involved with the screenplay of The Possessed. Fucking A. The Lady in the Lake is a 1943 detective novel by Raymond Chandler featuring the Los Angeles private investigator Philip Marlowe. Yep. Yep. Marlowe. Notable notable for its uh, removal of Marlowe from his usual Los Angeles environs for for much of the book. So the novel's complicated plot initially deals with the case of a missing woman in the small mountain town, much like this film, uh, 80 miles from the city. So the book was written shortly after the attack of Pearl Harbor and makes several references to America's recent involvement in World War II. I just thought that'd be a fun little thing to throw in there. So it's a it's another book by the same name. It's not the book that was bought. It's another book. Well, that yeah. Upon reading that, that's that's the uh, thing I took away from it. So it was just basically elements from that book that was thrown into this movie. Okay. But yeah, because because uh, the whole thing is is based on real events. Because the books were based on you know real events, which we'll get into in a bit. But yeah. uh, and then, you know it took place before that. Um, yeah, so really, yeah, yeah, about ten years before nineteen thirty three. I think is about when the uh, the real life events t- took place. Um, but actually, um, oh, that's right. Okay, one, yeah, the book thing- the book is kind of like the the murders. Okay. Now that yeah, and one thing that ha- – one of the things that was a part of the story of the books uh, that inspired the movie did take place after that, though, in 46 as well, now that I think about it. So I don't know. It might be – it might honestly be a really just cool coincidence that they happen to be named the same thing and have very similar stories. I don't um, know. It was so um, hard for us to do research for this episode that it was a challenge, and I love it. Uh, because yeah. <laughs> this might be the only source podcast wise for this film, so enjoy. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, the synopsis makes an explicit reference to the genre to which the story unfolding involves Irma's pain, you know, Mario's toughness, the, va- the failed adventure with the other guest, and the outcast father and the hunchback Francesco are not but the external stimulants of construing Giovanni's internal mysterious psychological drama throughout this dark and violent film. Overall, the final cut of the film evidence that the directors strive to eliminate characters and events diverting from the principal strand of the narrative in an isolated case, the scene with the honeymoon pictures, an idea was abandoned due to its literally nature that could not be real, realized convincingly 
in a visual way. On several occasions, the film conjures the most disturbing traits of the tale by omitting sexual and violent details still layered layered in the storyline. On the 10th of December 1964, the producer announced the new film to the cinema division of the Italian Ministry of Tourism and Entertainment as he applied for the certificate of the nationality. Uh, Bellini, is it? Oh, damn, I'm so sh- shit. Bolognini. <laughs> yeah, Bolognini. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm struggling over here. And uh, so Bolognini and some partners <laughs> had founded the production company BRC, which had the extremely low sum of 900,000 lira at its disposal. Hence, the possess was planned as an ultra-low budget effort. The entire film, including post-production, was supposed to cost a merely 136.5 million lira, whereas BRC raised 37,352,000 lira itself and contributed material and services. Shooting went on as long as eight weeks and was known for a rather long period due to bigger budget films being filmed for less time. At the end of the year, the ministry finished its assessment of the submitted script. The anonymous official praised the screenplay's psychological depth and artistic value. The ministry states that it's an indisputably committed work, definitely endowed and a noteworthy dramatic pathos. As the ministry often had to deal with more exploitive thrillers, this one of the few exclusively positive reviews for the films belonging to the yellow genre. The Possess premiered at the Locarno Festival on the 4th of July, 1965 to mixed and negative reviews. Italian films of the era were often multinational projects Mm -hmm. with actors, multiple nationalities who spoke their own languages and were ultimately dubbed over an Italian, which led to the heavy use of ADR in the film. And that made you question a lot of things, Brody. (laughs) That that, that it did because we got our lead actor to like, they're dubbing over his already well-spoken English with English again, but then it cuts back to two other um, people in the scene that is obviously speaking Italian mm-hmm. with English dub. So it's making me think when they're filming that scene together, does he actually know what they're saying? If he's already talking <laughs> in English and they're talking Italian or how does it I, I, I think he under I think the film it's film silent with them doing a performance. Yeah. And I think um, that they understand what they're saying to each other. I think that Peter Baldwin at this time worked enough on Italian cinema that he'd be able to understand what they're saying. So. Yeah, that was something I actually didn't know until this. That was actually one of my notes that I, I thought I'd put it in there because the entire time I was watching it, and I watched it in, in the original Italian uh, with English subtitles. And so there were just parts where I'm watching, and I'm like, his his lips do not match <laughs> what he is saying right now at all. And I'm like, but wait, they're dubbed over in Italian, but they're obviously speaking Italian as well. What is happening? And so I, I went and found that out. I also read, I'm not entirely confirmed on it, but I also read that uh, Sergio Leone, uh, who was also another big Italian director, did a lot of spaghetti westerns. Uh, a lot of the time, he wouldn't even bring audio recording equipment, apparently, on set when they were actually filming. <laughs> they would just film. And then he would just, he'd, he'd be, I'm not going to bother with the audio recording. We'll just dub it over later, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Fair uh, enough. Nick, take it away. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so I also found a, um, so the actor Peter Baldwin, um, who played the main character Bernard in this, uh, actually went on to direct a lot of TV um, back in the U.S. Whenever he came back, um, some of it was a little bit kind of surprising. He, that's, he that's a good directed, qu- that's, that's a good thing, Brody. Why did a bunch of Italian directors all of a sudden start making TV? <laughs> because TV basically took over cinema. In Italy, <laughs> how the fuck does that even happen? It got deregulized completely, and you could pretty much watch porn. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, <laughs> true freedom. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I found out. Yeah, he uh, he came back, um, and it, after acting for a little while longer, he just started directing. Uh, and then into the the seventies and eighties, he started directing a lot of TV shows. So Peter Baldwin directed a lot of episodes of uh, the Brady Bunch, 
uh, the Partridge Family. Um, he directed <laughs> he directed episodes of the fa- of Family Ties, uh, and he actually got an Emmy in the eighties um, for an episode of The Wonder Years that he directed as well. Um, and I found out that his final directing credit is from 2002, and it is an episode of Even Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I went back and watched the movie, and I'm like, man, he's great. You're going to grow up to direct an Even Stevens episode one day. <laughs> <laughs> is that I this just, episode's uh, takeaway character? Like, that's mine. Okay. Personally. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about this fucking artsy goddamn Jallo film, and we take away e- and even Stevens. Even yeah. Stevens. <laughs> Flip around, fifteen thousand dollar basket case got the Dark Knight uh, makeup guy. Like, <laughs> yeah, and this art house movie has got even Stevens. So it would have been great if it was like Malcolm in the Middle or something too. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been fantastic. I'd made my day. <laughs> so yeah. Um. And uh, another bit that I've got. I've got essentially what is a little true crime segment here because uh, I went and uh, after TJ, you asked me to help kind of like look through uh, to get some more information on the real life events that the story was based off of. Um, so I went and looked into it a bit. Uh, extremely difficult to find articles talking about it. Uh, I know you, you and I found the same WordPress article yes, yes. somebody wrote uh, that like lives in the area or something. So they just kind of knew the story. I tried to find more information than that person had, and unless I somehow managed to order a 1965 or 64 book that I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and this is not the one the movie was based off of. This was actually uh, a different book entirely. Uh, Another guy wrote a novel about it because he knew two of the victims personally uh, that I learned um, watching an episode of uh, (laughs) Profundo Nero. Uh, which appears to be just kind of like an unsolved mysteries style TV show that they have in what Italy, from what I could gather. What's the uh, what's the translation for that title? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't checked it yet. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I know that I think Profundo Russo is deep red. So deep black. Oh yeah. fuck! I do. So, so it's it's, it's deep black. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I found an episode of that talking about this story, and it was in Italian, and it was on YouTube, and it's got like 6,000 views, maybe. Like, <laughs> it is completely obscure, but I went and I sat through so much horrible auto-generated English over this this guy speaking uh, to learn as much as I could about this story. So basically, uh, in on May 9th, uh, 1933, at about 11.30 in the morning, a hotel maid n- named Emma, It's and this is, you're going to see, they did didn't change a whole lot for this movie or the I'm sure in the book either. Um, so it's a hotel maid named Emma, um, about 20 years old, uh, who was found in a room with iodine, uh, like smeared all right, like kind of around her mouth uh, and her throat had been cut. And there was just a razor sitting on uh, a nightstand next to her. So it gets reported. The police show up and everything. And they so what they assume is, is she Got into an argument. She was just newly engaged uh, that she had gotten into an argument and decided to kill herself. So she drank this poison, couldn't take it because apparently that the iodine poisoning is really painful. So she cut her throat. And that was just immediately what they assumed. Uh, they wrapped it up, even though there was apparently witness testimony that she'd uh, gotten into an argument with somebody who was like passing through town. Uh, and this is where that auto-generated English kind of came in because it didn't say – it said it was like, and the boyfriend of her came through of the town and a truck driver passing through who barely stayed for more than a day. They barely had a nod, so obviously something was wrong. I was like, oh, my god. OK. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she got into an argument. She found a letter in her nightstand in that room or something. Uh, either way, there was some suggestion of foul play. Fuckery. But yes, there was fuckery afoot. Uh, but this was fascist italy in 1933 and so the police came in went oh she killed herself and left and they didn't care um so december of that year later uh, the owner of the hotel aldo Do- aldo de toss is his name um he was the owner of the hotel that she worked in he got married to a woman named carolina F- carolina finazir 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 i don't know <laughs> um and whenever they got married they left for their honeymoon uh in venice 
because uh, apparently it was a tradition or something in early 1900s Italy. You, you would always go on your honeymoon in Venice. So they, they go to Venice and uh, Carolina's mother gets a call at some point during the trip uh, that Carolina's calling the wedding off. She doesn't want to be married to him anymore. She's leaving. I'm going to come back to Alleg- uh, Alleghe, uh and then I'm going to leave him and we're going we're to leave. And so the next day, she's already back in Alleghe, except she's dead in the lake. Uh, some kids had, were running around and thought they saw a rabbit came across and it was just this woman's body in the lake. Uh, so you guys, want to see a dead body? <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to see a dead body? <laughs> and then some Stephen King bullies show up with a knife and threaten them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, and so the the coroner gets called, and they immediately decide uh, she'd killed herself as well. Uh, they just immediately assumed it, um, but there was apparently markings on her throat that looked like she'd been strangled and dumped in the lake. And when asked about it, they went, oh no, that's decomposition. And she's been dead for a day in a frozen lake in the mountains. Not okay. sus, bro. <laughs> Not sus. Right. <laughs> so they ruled that one a suicide as well. Uh, and then nothing really goes on until about November of 1946. This is what I was talking about. Uh, this came out about three years after that. The Lady in the Lake book was, was mentioned earlier. Um, is a uh, Gigio, which this was another one the uh, the auto generate called him GI Joe the entire time. It was yeah. absolutely hilarious. Uh, Gigio and Luigia Del Monaco uh, were walking home uh, from I think it was like a pub. It was pretty late at night, and they were going up an alleyway, uh, and they were both shot to death and killed uh, while walking home. Uh, and the police ruled it as a robbery because a hundred thousand lira was missing from her purse. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how much 100,000 lira is, but when I looked it up, 1,000 lira is 65 cents American. So it wasn't a ton of money. <laughs> uh, but In 1990, immediately... the Italian lira was replaced by the euro. Indeed. Uh, so, yeah, that one got ruled as, as, as a robbery. But a friend of theirs, uh, the writer Sergio Savian, uh, actually took note of that and noticed um, – just all the other early murders and everything in that town and kind of put everything together a little bit. And he put it into a book called the mysteries of Allegi. Uh, and that one came out in 1964. So the year before this movie came out, I didn't see any mention of a connection between the two of them. Um, but I just thought, you know, there would be, it's pertinent information to it. It's all based on the same story in the end. Um, but yeah. And then, uh, from, from that show episode, I learned a little real life legend in that town that kind of may have, you know, influence the psychological horror aspect of it, the sort of more paranormal feel that you get is apparently, uh, so the lake was actually formed not terribly long ago, like the 1770s. 1771, there's a landslide uh, that came down and buried uh, a previous village that was in there with like 38 people in it and everything like under that lake. Uh, so there's a legend that when people die in that town, you hear ch- the church bell ring underneath the lake. And I just thought that was a cool story. It was probably going (laughs) to, it may have played into it, uh, especially since, you know, the director and the writers and everything are from Italy, probably much more familiar with that story in the area. So it might have had something to do with it. (laughs) Sound of Okay. Okay. There's my little true crime segment. (laughs) So roll up them sleeves any further if you can, Nick. Uh, Will do. (laughs) For the video. (laughs) So (laughs) you. I we kind of uh, disagree on this. I think mm. this is more of a psychological drama film than a Jallo. I do see the Jallo elements with the murders and stuff going on, and the twist and the the who done it and stuff. But at the same time, I think that this film is just riddled with dream sequences, flashbacks, mm. and is this real or not type th- things. And uh, I think that it's it more challenges. Is this real or not? Then it's uh, than the typical Jali film, right? Yeah, no, I uh, I can agree with that for sure. Um, I, I was seeing it, uh, that it's, and I think we talked about this too beforehand. A couple of years, is that it's proto Giallo, yes. really. Um, it's not quite, but there's there's elements to it a lot. I noticed I felt a lot of similarities between this and Suspiria. Honestly, watching. Bernard walk around uh, just the tight corridors and everything. And like, especially the scene where he's on the phone when Mario finds him and he's mm-hmm. talking to Francesco near the end, um, things like that. It it was like watching Susie Banyan walk around the, the 
You can see where Argento would right. take this and translate it into his own films with his larger set pieces and then some of his more dreamlike sequences in films like Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Suspiria, and then uh, even Stendhal Syndrome with the more trippy type stuff. Yeah, and I mean, just a lot of how it's shot and everything just felt very similar. The cinematography, um, I'm sure this at least impressed upon Argento cinematography and stuff as well. Um, I think it even went a bit further, but I kind of want to wait until we do our uh, our impact yeah. segment at the bottom to talk about that. There's a another much, much, much more recent film that I think took a little inspiration from this as well. Okay. Brody, you had some thoughts on uh, this film and uh, kind of what it inspired other films. Yeah, I, I, I potentially like it. Well, when I watch a lot of uh, 1980s horror, like gothic horror films, mm -hmm. I see a lot of cinematography elements taken from this film in there. Whether or not they were actually inspired by this film, I just – but it might be just the actual like uh, genre of Jello itself that it's been inspired from. Yes. Like for instance, uh, the Changeling from 1980, or uh -huh. also from 1980. Um, the Brody, Shining, I, I, I saw a company selling replica balls from the Changeling. Fuck, that's awful. Tell, me, <laughs> tell me this now. <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah, that but that that was sort of the, uh, what I sort of took away from it. You know, you just got those. Uh, like all, all that camera play with the lighting, the cinematography mainly for me. Uh, yeah, just as I said, whether or not this film itself inspired those films, I think it's just the term Jello. And yeah, mm -hmm. so which Bazzoni went on to to do Jello. I've kind of listened, you know, uh, arguably point. one of the best, one, one. of the best. Yeah. And <laughs> tune into season two because <laughs> I'm gonna piss people off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get into that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought it kind of a possible American example um, of something similar to this. It had some Chinatown vibes a little bit, I thought. Mysterious family, outside guy just kind of investigating it. He's literally a private investigator in Chinatown, but, you know, he's just doing it of his own accord eventually. I, I know it's initially he comes and, you know, gets hired uh, by one of the main characters. But, you know, there's you got your murder, you got your intrigue, you got your family plots, rich family in you know in the town with a lot of What else could you need? Shop and everything. It it felt like a cross between a Jalo film and Chinatown. Um with like a little, you know, murder on a train mystery like <laughs> it, it thrown in that very mid-century kind of a uh, bit for it and um a suitcase for a corpse was another one that i saw which actually kind of harkens back a little bit so a suitcase for a corpse from 1971 is about a movie man uh murders his i believe it's his fiance after he finds out she's cheating on him and the whole movie is just him trying to get away with it by hiding her body in the suitcase which i read it and i went that's rope that is hitchcock's rope when the two guys murder their harvard uh like colleague and they have him in a, a chest and they host a party and they're trying to like get the way with the perfect <laughs> murder. And so they host a party and, and like have the guy's family and stuff over and his body is just in this trunk and it's just them trying not to get caught. And so I don't know. I saw it. I was like, man, Hitchcock kind of played a little bit of a role in yeah. like some of the development of this stuff too, um, which I love his movies. I, I love Hitchcock. Who movies doesn't? Oh, yeah. Uh, my mom, actually, specifically, uh, we we had to go uh, we had to go to a family reunion one time. And we were staying in this motel. Little did we know, every single room in this motel was themed, and our family didn't tell us before we got there. We got the Hitchcock room. <laughs> I, was, I was loving it. There was that giant uh, profile of him holding his finger up in front of his mouth that was over the bed, and my mom could barely sleep, and I was like, this is awesome. There's fake psycho <laughs> blood stains in the shower. Oh, my God. My mom's like, I'm glad you're having fun. I hate this place. <laughs> After Nick leaves the room, they run a blue light over it, and there's just fucking <laughs> light everywhere. Oh. Oh no! <laughs> That's right. Those, Those are not blood stains. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking a, yeah. Uh, Arrow released the Fifth Chord, Bazzoni's other film. Uh, like I said, I think it's fucking amazing. And then, of course, we mentioned uh, Footprints on the Moon as well earlier, and uh, 
that film's just fucking far out, and that's considered a Jalo film as well. So hopefully one day that gets a proper release in the states, and we're able to review it and talk about it more. Speaking of talk about it, let's do it. <laughs> Okay, guys, what's your favorite performance, Slick, Nick? I'm going to have to go with Irma, honestly. Um, I, I know, uh, I think, Brody, you said uh, earlier, whenever we were talking about um, kind of the ending and we were we were still discussing right before this, you know, so wait, who killed who again? <laughs> <laughs> did, we, did we exactly find out who did? Uh, and to which the, the big reveal sort of at the end is supposed to be of, of at least when I thought of Irma uh, actually having been the one to, to commit a lot of the murders uh, throughout the course of the movie. Um, and I, I believe whenever I said that, you went, I knew it. I was like, I didn't. <laughs> I actually, that one actually fooled me. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so just kind of her performance of mostly just being somewhat on edge, but honestly, you couldn't quite tell if it's because she's guilty or she's just a victim of this whole thing. Um, and just really stressed out and everything, because they talk about, you know, their business is starting to fail at this point after Tilda's death and everything. Um, so I don't know, just her whole performance throughout it, I thought was just great, honestly. Um, Peter Baldwin as Bernard. I think that it's just he's exquisite. Uh, I think that in the time where Italian actors were t- using American names, he manages to be an American actor and fit in to an Ital- like almost like fit in unanimously with those Italian big names. You know what I mean? He almost fits into there with the other actors. He, he looks the part very well. And I, I think that he uh, his performance really allows the 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 story to be told and his interactions uh, with some of these possessed uh, <laughs> townsfolk or residents of the Centra- uh, what is it? Hotel Central. Uh, Centrale. Centrale. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just cool. It's cool as fuck. I love it. Mm. Yeah. I, I'd have to go with uh, Bernard as well. Like, you know, like every time we do same on the screen, like he, he just delivers such a powerhouse performance whether Mm -hmm. there's not really much physicality in this role but it's all about emotion and every time this well well, as this film progresses the emotion on this guy in his body posture in his facial texture it slowly gets like a depressed a depressed feeling like the more that he keeps progressing on finding out this story when he looks out the window at the end you can feel it yeah you can feel it by the end of this film. You can feel it, and you f- like you feel what he feels, and um, that's what I love about him. And if you took away the dialogue and just had this film with no dialogue, you could actually just see it, and you would even still feel it again. Like it was just, I don't know, something about this lead actor. He just brought that vibe. I fucking agree. So set piece, the hotel man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That hotel. I'm, I'm gonna have to disagree and go to the graveyard. Oh, Ooh, just because, see just just with that, you know, rich and subtle dark shadow play on the stone markings. You know, whether or not the cinematography obviously helped with the um, that dreamlike sequence bit, but we do see it uh, possibly. I think again in the third act where it's not a dream. And it just yeah, it's you know, it's crazy because he meets Tilda initially in the graveyard, right? And yeah, then yeah. we see him meet her again, but she's dead. That's right, yeah. yeah. And it's in the graveyard. It's just, oh, it's really just so atmospheric! It's just so yeah. atmospheric, and it's a beautifully fucking shot scene, which also helps as well. So, but yeah, that that that's it for me. That that scene. When he returns, it. it's not portrayed in the same way, though. I think the first time we see the grave. I think the first time we see the graveyard, it's in the high contrast style because he's remembering it in a flashback. And then whenever we see it in real time, he's kind of visiting her grave. And then it's not. It's kind of the, what we actually see, the way that the graveyard is. And like Brody said, that fuck, it is cool. But I think like the sea with the hotel being right next to the water and stuff, and we see some of the shots of the lady standing there and just some of the inside corridors of the hotel – uh, I just think it's creepy as fuck. It's almost like the Bates house. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I would say the hotel's pretty great. I actually really liked um, Francesco's photo studio as well, too, his little cave mm-hmm. that he had going on back in there. Because, I mean, 
he's supposed to be like you said earlier, he's the hunchback one and his photo studio really whenever he goes back in to show him, you know, the, the pictures, the negatives uh, that he'd had of Tilda before she died, where he was trying to show that she was potentially, you know, pregnant. Here's my, the reason why she was murdered and all of that. And it's just dark, high contrast. He's kind of hunched over the entire time and he's going around putting all that. I liked that as well. Um, I might actually go with that over the hotel, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Ooh, changing it up. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Fucking a so favorite shot slash scene. I think the ending is fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that scene Excellent. of uh, Irma running hysterically away down the uh, shore of the lake after confessing to Bernard that she'd killed Mario and her dad mm-hmm. and everything, and just and then the immediate you know snap cut that they had again. That was a good one. That was really good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> look at the blood on my hands. Yeah. Uh, oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that or um, the scene of the other dream sequence of him and Francesco uh, out on the lake uh, in the boat when he when he just goes off and they have that argument and he just monologues at him and then he wakes up sweating. I think the point of view shots we see in the hallways are incredible. And I think that they are just echoed in Jallo films and slasher films for years to come. You just took the words out of my goddamn mouth. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. That's why I was feeling the Suspiria <laughs> in the interior shots like that. I'm serious. Yeah. It, that fear and tension and the build up to what we finally revealed is oh, so fucking good. And that's what I was talking about before with uh, the lights of gothic horror, like the, the Changeling and the Shining. You can tell that's heavily borrowed from that type of filmmaking. It's mm-hmm. just so beautifully shot. Even the lighting technique's amazing in that. Mm-hmm. Mm. I think whatever you're trying to shoot or whatever you have to shoot without color in this instance, uh, lighting is going to be a, a much more important factor for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Fucking a. So va- favorite effect slash death. I think uh, just seeing everybody dead at the end, kind of like the Agatha Christie mm-hmm. thing at the end where everyone gathers, but they're all dead. Uh, you can see that kind of like in Sleepaway camp two and three. Whatever, like you see all the bodies stashed away and shit. Like this is the type kind of vibe, and you, you know he runs into that room and everybody's just in there, fucking dead. Just like ah, what the fuck? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and it's pretty much the only like scene we get with it, with death in it, really. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. I, uh. There is, I think, the bit. It's. I believe it's another dream sequence. It's the one where he gets the note from Mario to meet him in the slaughterhouse, and then he goes in, and Mario confesses to. Oh, uh, Tildy was blackmailing me and my father. I didn't want to kill her, but now you know too much. It. And then it does the you know quick rush cut, and then uh, I guess he's supposed to have attacked Bernard or killed him uh, off screen with the window and the blood splat, and then he wakes up. Everything. Um, I, I liked that one a bit as well too, because uh, it also showed Tildy's actual like death. It showed a clip back to it uh, in a flashback of Mario going up to her room and everything. Um, I think that I think that might be mine. So thoughts on Storé? This one's pretty nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I like that they did. They didn't really change a whole lot from the actual real life story. They just played up certain elements of it because the real life one is kind of crazy. It's almost it's two films at the same time. Yeah, it's yes. the, it's like the Jallo mystery of, uh what is it, Irma's murders, and then also mm-hmm. going on with Bernard's obsession slash love affair with uh, Tilda. It's fucking cool. Uh, we don't know if they're actually connected other than location. So that's yep. what kind of makes it so much better. And the story leaves us with zero conclusion and the fact that this guy did it for no fucking reason. And I think <laughs> that that's why it stands out to me. And a lot of these same story elements and plot points we've seen just like the shots of the uh, point of view in the hallway, uh, these story elements are echoed in later Jalo and onto slasher films for years to come. Yeah. The Absolutely. the no clear conclusion was pretty great. Again, that's part of the reason. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. I will keep drawing comparisons. To this <laughs> <movie>. <laughs> I love Chinatown. <laughs> Fuck, it. Brody. Yeah, no, like I, I really 
enjoyed this film like it's a it's a neat little murder mystery story um it even had me guessing the whole way through who'd done it but then even at the end um we don't really know exactly what went down because we've got well we do we know the premise of the story but he never we never really get a conclusion that we are happy it's it's basically left up to us to decide and that's as like you said i really love about it myself um Mm -hmm. but it's also got these little i don't don't really want to say but it's like sub sub genres in there as i've always said like the gothic horror element you know um just it was it was basically a paranormal feel as i was watching this and that's helped drive it home for me you know, just the element of surprise. And, was it know, a paranormal film or was it shot to almost be paranormal and it's only because it's all in his head? Well, that, that that's what I was sort of feeling. Like um, I was sort of paranoid going along this journey thinking maybe it's this, maybe it's that, you never know. And it like there was elements of surprises in certain scenes and, you know, just, oh, yeah. It, I even still think about it now. Like did this actually happen or what, what was real, what wasn't real? That's what I really love about this film. It's open-ended. Um, just something different. Fucking A. Impact and takeaways before we rate this bad boy. I think I've said enough about the impact. Takeaways. Uh, I love this fucking film. I think this is a great beginning for Luigi Bazzoni and a good entry for anybody that wants to go into his filmography. Uh, if you like Italian cinema, this is a good place to start nick absolutely sure oh you already heard my takeaway bernard directed even stevens uh no um i yeah i definitely agree um this movie definitely uh, absolutely now that i can finally sit down and watch it it really does feel like it has impacted a whole lot of the uh, later jalo movies and just stuff in general that i've seen um one of the things that i took note of uh, that I said there is a much more recent movie. Um, if you've seen the, fa- it's a found footage movie, uh, Creep. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, the scene uh, after Adriana uh, throws the note out the window to Bernard when he's standing out back having a cigarette, uh, and he goes to find it, can't, and then goes to meet her by the lake because he keeps thinking he's, you know, seeing her go out there. Um, and at this point, you still have everybody's still absolutely a suspect when he's sitting there and he's just leaning over the railing out over the lake with his back turned to everything, having the cigarette. And I'm just immediately getting flashes in my head from creep of Aaron sitting on the bench at the end of the movie and yeah. Joseph walking up with the wolf mask behind him. And I'm like, turn around. <laughs> ah, and he even makes it a note because in, in the end of creep and he kills him and then it cuts back to him kind of showing it. And he's like, why didn't you just turn around? You actually genuinely trusted me to not hurt you at all. And I think that's because you were pretty trusting and that was pretty cool. Thanks for letting me kill you. So yeah, like it, <laughs> <laughs> that, that shot, that ex- the establishing shot of him out there trying to go out, trying to coincidentally run into Adriana and that night that, you know, when the couple sees him and she runs off, yeah. it just, I was like, I've seen this scene. I've seen this scene somewhere before and I was trying to think, I'm like, that's creep. That's the end of creep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's a good film for up and coming filmmakers to actually watch this you know like um like it's it's if, if you lay this film out in its categories of cinematography and all that it's very basic but it's all comes down to the storytelling as well and i think the storytelling is written it's it's written clever but it's very basic at the same time as well if you know what i mean um so I think this would be a good one for all you up and coming uh, filmmakers out there to actually watch watch this film, treat yourself, and yeah, get a bit of an idea for what actually like is true filmmaking. None of that Michael Bay shit. So yeah. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> okay, so let's rate this motherfucker. How many out of five overexposed dream sequences are you gonna give this? I might have to go above my own pick basket case. I might have to go to like four and a half. <laughs> I am going to give it a 4.6. What'd you say it was, Nick? Uh, four and a half. 4.5. I'm going to give it a four and a half as well. 4.5. So that's four and a half of exposed dream sequences at a five. 
for 1965's The Possessed. And next week's episode is Brutta Kane. An Aussie cult classic from Down Under called Razorback from 1984. Fucking A. Yes. So we will have a replacement host. We will have Matt Sterling, or as you guys know him as Quarter J from the Comics and Kaijus podcast, joining us to host. So stay tuned for that. And I want to take some time right now to thank each and every one of you who listened to the last two episodes and helped us get to the iTunes Top 200 uh, we peaked at 170 last week, and we are extremely grateful. Uh, we have the most successful launch in Project Louder history. We have over 5,000 subs. It is just overwhelming, the response to this show. And thank you. And if you guys would be so gracious to go on to uh, iTunes and give us a rating and a review, uh, it would be much appreciated. And of course, head on over to projectlouder.net for more content and other great shows from the Project Louder Podcasting Network. Anything you guys want to add? I don't really have anything other than just, yeah, every, thanks to everyone who subscribed and everything. Uh, yeah, you sent me those numbers. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was I was waking up to those numbers and I nearly jumped out of fucking bed real quick. Yeah. And I nearly got fucking, yeah. nearly got carpet burned. So, yeah, no, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Th- thanks to our listeners out there. We You're a bloody bunch of fucking legends, so. That yes. you are. So I think that is it for this episode of Lights, Camera, Exploitation. This is your host with the motherfucking most, TJ Bowser, signing off. This is your DKB signing out, and I shall see you next week. Arrivederci. (laughs) 